me tell you a few things that will happen. You heard we have an extra service this coming Sabbath. It's 5 o'clock. Let me tell you the reason for that. We will have a healing service. God does not like sickness among his people. And God desires to relieve us of our suffering. So this coming Sabbath afternoon, we will have a healing service based on James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Now, there's some verses I want you to write down, and I will tell you how to prepare for the healing service. Let me give you the preparation steps now. If you're sick and you want to be part of the healing service, here's what we're asking you to do. We believe that sickness and sin go together, which means healing and forgiveness have to go together. Somebody say amen. All right. Step number one. If you have done someone something wrong, find that person between now and Sabbath afternoon and apologize. Did I say something abusive? No. Okay. If you have done something wrong to someone and you know it, you have sinned against someone, find that person and say you're sorry. Two, if someone has hurt you and you are as innocent as a goose, but someone has hurt you because God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, you find that person and say, you did this and this to me. It caused me great harm. It caused me financial loss. It damn Whatever it was, let the person know what he or she did. And then say, but because I have been touched by the Spirit of God, I have come to say, what? I forgive you. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Forgive us our debts as... If we do not forgive people, God will not forgive us. And step number three, if there is something in your life you know to be sin right now, confess it and put it away. Then you come, we'll pray, anoint you with oil. Now let me give you the biblical connections between healing and spiritual healing as well. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Please write this down. Then we'll get into our message, the science of the resurrection. Exodus 15, verse 26, the Bible says, and this is God speaking to the Israelites, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will keep his commandments, and, gi and give ear to all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you that I have brought upon the Egyptians. I am the Lord that does what? Healeth thee. Next verse. Uh, Exodus 23, verse 25. Write that one down. Exodus 23, verse 25. And ye shall serve the Lord your God. Notice what comes first. Ye shall serve the Lord your God. And he shall bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. But there is service connected. First line. Notice Exodus 15, 26. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. And will do that which is right in his sight. And will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. That's obedience. I will put none of these diseases on you. Text number 3. Psalm 103, verse 3. Or we can read from verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Verse 3. Who forgiveth how many iniquities? All thy iniquities. Who healeth how many diseases? All thy diseases. In these three verses, we have seen obedience to God's will and the removal of sickness. Passage number 4, James chapter 5, reading from verse 14. Please write that down. James 5, reading from verse 14. It's 20 after 7. I want to jump into the message, but this is important. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, here we have sins again. 
they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. Go and tell people you've done wrong. Apologize. Forgive those who've hurt you. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I was telling some friends today, I believe many people in church are sick for one reason only. They do not take advantage of James 5, 14 to 16. And so they remain sick needlessly. And so this coming Sabbath afternoon at 5, we shall have the healing service. I'll give you another verse. Mark chapter 6. Reading verse 13. Mark 6, 13. The Bible says, And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And Mark 16, verses 17 and 18. In 15 we're told, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then in verses 17 and 18, Jesus gives some signs that will follow. They shall speak in tongues, they shall take up dangerous things and not be hurt, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. The preaching of the gospel must be accompanied by the evidences of God's miraculous power. Of course, the greatest evidence of God's power is a changed life. Don't ever forget that. The greatest evidence of God's existence is His Word. The greatest proof that Jesus was God is not that he raised Lazarus, but that he fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy. You see, that's the word. But Christ's miracles were the reason why some people believed. He said at one point, if you don't believe what I say, then believe what I do. In John 15, verse 22, he said, If I have not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. In verse 24, he says, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, meaning by my words... That's the witness of who I am by my works. The word is the message of the gospel, the works, the miracles that he performed as a support for the message. I'm not here to say God will heal every single person. I don't know what God will do. I'm not in his mind, but I do know this. I have seen God heal people. And there's no reason why he will not do it here. If you were sick, you know the preparations, the three things I said. One more thing, 23 after 7. If you know someone who is sick, you're fine, but you know someone who's sick, you can represent that person in the service. You have to go through the same preparation and get that person's permission, and the person does the same thing. You have a grandfather in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, or someplace, and you call him, you say, Granddad, we're having a healing service, and the preacher said to do thus, thus, thus. Are you willing? Granddad says, Yes. Will you give me permission to represent you? Yes, you and he become one in the preparation. He does it, you do it, then you represent him. I have seen God heal people who were not present. They were hundreds of miles away, but they were represented. Remember the man who was lowered through the roof? He was out of it. The Bible says, when Jesus saw whose faith? The faith of the friends. What did he do? He healed the man. We can stand in the gap for people. Let me tell you quickly, last year I was in a Kenya doing a crusade and I had a healing service and I told the people exactly what I just said. This lady stood for a little baby. She had been in the hospital about three months with leukemia and was there for three months. They told me this lady stood for her. It was her aunt. We had the healing service. The next day the doctors did their usual examination, not knowing that the aunt had stood in a healing service and they found no sign of leukemia or whatsoever. The baby was discharged the next day and they sent me an email. Why isn't the roof coming off with amen? <laughs> Over there, they do shout. <laughs> they do. Here, I guess we don't because the hospital is right here. But God can do miracles for us. He can and He wants to. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We have about 30 minutes left. Father, I have so much to say. If I need five extra minutes, Father, soften the hearts of your people that they may give that to me. Now grant me the words to say and give them a heart that loves truth. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The science of the resurrection, Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 16. Someone sent a question, uh, why do you read from the King James? I just like it. I love the language, that's all. But read whatever version you have. So I just thought I'd say that. 
I didn't have a vision that I should use this and another. I just love the language. Verse 16, Genesis 2, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, finish it with me, thou shalt surely die. Now, in chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. In verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Now, what is God saying? God is comparing what Adam did with what he said. Are you following me? There are people who believe all you need is grace, and then do what you like. God is examining obedience. God said, Adam, as far as I can remember, and I don't forget, I told you, don't eat of this tree. And the word I used was command. The very first use of the word command is in Genesis 2.16. Now, Adam, how do you know you were naked? Did you do what I told you not to do? In other words, did you disobey? Did you go contrary to my will? When God was handing out the judgments or the punishments in verse 17, He said to Adam, and unto Adam He said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. God said, Because you disobeyed, because you went contrary to what I said, we have to understand that at the very heart of sin is a deliberate going contrary to the will of God. I'll say something more serious. Sin originated with Satan. Let's go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Let's read verse 13. Isaiah 14, verse 13, we continue with the science of the resurrection. We have to establish first the, the terrible reality that sin is. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now this was Lucifer's ambition. He wanted to replace God. This is sin. John 8, 44, Jesus speaking. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now this beginning goes way past Adam. It goes right back to his attack on Jesus Christ and his government. Sin is a direct attack on the government of God. Sin is 9-11 against heaven. Are you listening to me? It is a direct attack. One of the problems we have, we have a benign approach to sin. We view sin as if it is just poor judgment. Sin is, well, I wouldn't do that. I'm sorry you did it. And that's our attitude to sin. Just poor judgment, bad choice. Sin is a direct attack against the government of God. If a sinner were to be allowed to live as long as is possible and for sin to work out itself, it would culminate on that person trying to kill God. At its highest expression, sin is an attempt on the life of God. Calvary shows us that. Sin is an attempt to kill God. Now, we do that in many little ways. We try to kill and silence and remove Him from our lives. Sin is not just bad judgment. Sin is homicidal towards God. It is murderous. And that's what Adam did. He sinned against God. By sinning against God, you see, to go against one thing, you have to go for something else. Because the Bible is clear, there are always two choices. He that is not for me, finish it for me. Is against me. He that is not scattering with me is, he that is not gathering with me is, scattering against me. Two choices from Genesis to Revelation. To sin against God, you've got to cooperate with another power. Adam leagued with the devil against God. 
That's sin. And so the penalty for that is death. We talked about that death earlier today. It is the second death. What else is sin? Sin, the Bible says, is transgression of God's law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. It is transgression of God's law. Now, God's law has always been in place because His law is a reflection of Himself. God's law is the very foundation of the government of God, which is the ruling power in the universe. Let me say that again. God's law is the foundation of his government, which is the ruling power in the universe, but it has been challenged. If you read Exodus chapter 25, verse 16, when God gave Moses instructions for the construction of the ark, the central piece of furniture in the tabernacle. I say the central. As a matter of fact, all that happened, all the services were actually focused on the ark and what the ark represented and what it contained because it contained that which was violated. That's God's law. So verse 16, Exodus 25, the Bible said, And thou shalt put into the ark the testament which I shall give thee. The testimony being the Ten Commandments. You ask me, how do I know that? Exodus 31, verse 18. The Bible says, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. The Ten Commandments are a testimony. What is a testimony? A testimony is a witness. A testimony is a statement supporting something. The Ten Commandments are testimonies of who God is, what He stands for, His character. They testify of the character of God. They are a witness of the goodness of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. The Ten Commandments are as sacred as God Himself, and they are the foundation of His throne. Sin was an attack against that foundation. It was an attack against God Himself. I am trying to paint sin in as ugly a picture picture as I possibly can. When you think about a little sin, or I think about a little sin, what is a little attempt to kill me? Does that mean you lose a small gun, a small knife, a thimble full of poison? What is a small attempt to kill someone? Sin is an attempt on God's life, attempt on his government. This is what Satan did. This is what Adam did in cooperation with the power that originally attacked God, the devil. That's sin. Terrible thing. Violation of God's law, attack against God's government. And the penalty for that is death. Not just the death which we die every day, but the second death from which there is no return. Now we're talking about the science of the resurrection. Now, not simply death. Not the death of anyone, because an angel could not come and die. I am sure the angels wanted to come and die in the place of Jesus Christ because they love him. I am sure Gabriel, the highest angel, wanted to come and die. But sin is so grievous, the payment for sin has to be made by someone equal to the law that sin went against. You can tell how horrible sin is by who hung on that cross. You see, this was God, equal with the Father. This was the God who created the heavens and the earth. The very creator had to pay the penalty for sin. That tells us how horrible sin is and how tremendous the price that has to be paid. The death of one member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, in human form, in a form that made him able to die and, of course, able to be tempted. So Jesus came, he lived, and he died. There are some people who say the death of Christ was enough. The atonement finished on the cross. He just had to die. That's it. Have you ever considered if all Jesus had to do was die, there was no need for him to get up? Are you listening to me? If all that was necessary was for Jesus to die, there was no need for him to come from the grave. But he came from the grave... You see, the death of Jesus Christ is the penalty for sin. He paid it when he died. But now he has to give us power to live 
free from the power of sin. That power is his resurrected life. Are you following me? It is his resurrected life. It is a mystery that cannot be fully explained. How can a dead man raise himself? But that's what Jesus did. And when the Bible says the Father raised him, it simply means the Father authorized him to get up when he did. But Jesus' resurrected life provides the power to live victoriously after we have accepted the payment for our sins. His death was the payment. The Bible is clear. The wages of sin is death. So he died. Now having paid the price, how shall we live? By my life. If we are justified by his death, we shall be saved by his life, Paul tells us. And so Jesus came up from the grave. We've talked about that. Now Paul is at pains to make it clear that the resurrection actually happened. And that's why I call this subject the science of the resurrection. 23 minutes left. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. We shall read from verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. And this is Paul speaking to a church that had a problem with the doctrine of the resurrection. They thought there was no resurrection. And there's no resurrection, there's no gospel. No gospel, no salvation. We're all lost. And Christ is not even risen from the dead. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, says Paul. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, the greater part of whom remain to this present, but some of them are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and finally, he was seen of me as of one born out of time. Last of all, he was seen of me. Paul is assembling his witnesses to prove that Jesus Christ came up from that grave. Now the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 19, you don't need to turn there, against an elder receive not an accusation except before two or three witnesses. Now follow me closely. I want to linger on witnesses. Against an elder. Anyone who is an elder in the church? Can I see your hands? Any elders in the churches? God bless you. You cannot bring an accusation against that man or that man unless you have two or three people with you. The Bible forbids you. I think it's Deuteronomy 19.15. The Bible says, No man can be punished or put to death on the testimony of one witness. Deuteronomy 17.6. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But in the mouth of one witness he shall he not be put to death. A man in the days when God had this theocracy, he could not be put to death based on the testimony of one witness. There had to be at least two or three. In John chapter 5, Jesus from verse 30 but right down to verse 47, Jesus gives all those who witness to the fact that he was indeed the son of God. He talked about John the Baptist. Then he talks about the miracles that he did. Then he goes down that his father was a witness. Then in verse 39, the scriptures are witness. Ye search the scriptures for them, ye think ye have eternal life, and they are there which testify of me. Then verse 45 to 47, Moses. And in John 8, 14, he himself is a witness. He knows that in the Jewish system, there must be witnesses for something to be established as a fact. Acts 5, 32. Peter says, and we are witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost. Talking about the events of the crucifixion of Christ. Peter said, we are witnesses, and the Holy Ghost is a witness. God requires the testimony of witnesses. Now the righteousness of God is revealed, apart from the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets witness to the righteousness apart from works. Paul is calling witnesses. And in verse 5, 1 Corinthians 15, then he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. That's one witness. So he's saying, if you don't believe me, go talk to Peter. 
After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. They all saw Jesus Christ at the same time, so each person can check the other person's story. If Jesus had appeared to them individually, each person could have given an individual account. You know how eyewitnesses report accidents. Each person says something different. So eyewitness accounts are very unreliable in a court of law, I'm told. I'm no lawyer. They're not absolutely reliable because people tend to see different things under stress. Paul probably knows that. Paul is saying, well, 500 people can't be wrong. He's calling 500. A few of them died. But the greater part remain to this present, says Paul. Then in the next verse, he says, after that, he was seen of James as the brother of Jesus. Then of all the apostles. Now, in verse 5, Peter sees him and the 12. In verse 7, James and all the apostles. Hundreds of people. Of all the events in the life of Christ, the resurrection is the most verifiable. By that I mean, biblically, it is easiest to establish. And the principles upon which it is established are scientific. When you write your term paper and your research paper, do you use witnesses? What do you call them? Footnotes. Or endnotes. And you say that Linus Pauline said, and you put that in your research on vitamin C. And you say that Ben Carson said, you put that in your research on pediatric neurosurgery. And this person said, and that person said, and you call a cloud of witnesses. And then you present your paper and you get an A because A is for Adventists. Can you say amen? <laughs> huh? You use your footnotes. Witnesses. Well, Paul does the same thing. He uses footnotes with feet. People, 500, maybe 600. Why? Because Paul is desperate to establish that the resurrection actually happened. Now, why is the resurrection necessary? I told you, it provides the power for us to live. It provides the power to develop that character that goes from earth to heaven unchanged. When Jesus comes, he changes our body. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. You now sometimes, if you see me talking too quickly when I get excited, all you have to do is, I'll see you, the camera won't catch you, and I will know you mean, especially if English is not your first language, I tend to get excited. So all you have to do is, preacher, well, I don't like that, no, just... And I will slow down if I can afford to, based on the swift passage of time. Did I say Philippians? What chapter did I say? What verse? I didn't. <laughs> okay, Dr. Chives, the verse is 20. Philippians 3, verse 20. Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven, meaning our citizenship. You see, in verse 17, Paul had told the brethren, Use me as an example. Follow me and my, my, my apostles, you see. In verse 20, he says, Why? For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who shall do what? Change our vile bodies, which is this one, that it might be fashioned according to what? His glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able to subdue even all things unto himself. Paul is saying, when Jesus comes, we are looking for him to come, because when he comes, he will change this vile body. We will undergo an immediate bodily change and the power that God uses to change the body, Paul says, is the same power he uses to hold the entire universe together whereby he's able even to subdue all things unto himself. Colossians 1.17, and in him all things consist. And that power is the power of life. A flower at the side of the road, unfurling its colors and releasing its aroma. It does that by the controlling power that originates from the Creator Himself. This is the very power that God uses to transform us in the twinkling of an eye. It is the same power He uses to sustain us as we take this spiritual walk, it is the very resurrection power of Jesus Christ. The power over death, the power over hell, the power over the grave, the power over the devil, the power over all those things that scare us and terrify us, even as we call ourselves Christians, the power to live free from the terror of the grave 
And the terror of the enemy and the terror of hell is the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. And that life comes to you and to me when we by faith receive Jesus Christ. My beloved brothers, I am trying to get it across to you as clearly as I can. There is power available from Christ to live now as if we are already in heaven. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that. Name some people who are in heaven, quickly. Enoch, nice man, someone else. Moses, someone else. Elijah, someone else. <laughs> Jesus is a man, that's right. Somebody say amen. Jesus is a human being now. He's also God, but he's still a human being. Paul says, there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Colossians 2 verse 9. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. How? Bodily. Christ is th now glorified human flesh. But human. So yes, Jesus is there. Who else is there? Doors resurrected when Christ came from the grave. The four and twenty elders and others who are there, they are in heaven now. How do you think they live? By what law and by what principle? Heaven's laws. Heaven's laws. Give me three words for heaven's laws. The? Yes. That's all the law heaven has. Are you with me? That's all the law heaven has. That was the law Lucifer violated. So the Bible says in uh, 1 John 3 verse 8, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. That was the law the angels broke. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, this has been God's standard of living from eons from everlasting unto everlasting god never changes his standards and what god does his standard is so high you see if the standard by which jesus lives now is the standard by which i'm supposed to live i need help because i am not born with a mind for that kind of living may i politely say you need help can i have an amen you look as though you do, and so do I. What does that help? The very life of Christ. And Christ demonstrated the power of his life by crashing through hell, the grave, and death. And he gives you that life through faith and through his word. Now you say, how is it given through his word? The resurrected life of Christ the revitalizing Christ of life of Christ, the quickening life of Christ is given through His Word. John chapter 6, verse 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have what? No life. Then he explains why he said that. Verse 63, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There is resurrected life in the Word of God. Why do you think the devil keeps you so busy you have no time for this? That's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ. What does he mean, risen with Christ? You're still on the earth. How are you risen with Christ? By faith you enter into his resurrection. That's why Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. If ye then be risen with Christ, if you by faith have entered the stream of that resurrection power, seek those things which are above. Because that's what the life of Christ does. It changes the mind. It alters the thinking. It makes us spiritual beings. And our greatest joy come from spiritual things. Not video games. And who wears what on a red carpet? And who divorce who? 
and then whatever they do. Spiritual things. Because now we are spiritual beings in the flesh. And that spiritual power, I say, is the same power that allowed Christ to break out of the tomb and to ascend glorious, glorified. And that power, I repeat with tedium, is available to us, my beloved brothers and sisters, as we go about our business, you and I. We ought to live with the consciousness that while we may not have the appearance of angels, we may not have the glow on their faces, but we have their standard in our hearts. We must live like we are in heaven before we enter heaven. Let me repeat that. When Jesus comes, I told her he changes the body. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. That will happen in the twinkling of an eye. But that which has been developed on the inside of the character is untouched. Because the transformation occurs before Jesus comes. Christ isn't coming to save anyone. He's coming to collect the saved. Are you following me? He is coming to get those who, have, who are now being transformed by his resurrected life. So Paul says, like as Christ was raised up from the grave by the glory of the Father, even so we ought to walk in newness of life. What's the newness of life? The resurrected life of Jesus Christ. Now he came up with the resurrected life and the glorified body. We have the same weak body, but in us can exist that glorified life. Even in this weak container, we can have the glory of God. And that is what God desires. Therein lies the stupendous, stupendous power of the gospel that in a sinful person can be seen the life of Jesus Christ. Impossible, you say, and I say yes, outside of Christ. In fallen flesh, controlled by the Spirit, can be seen clearly the righteous life of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says in John 14, verse 19, 20, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. Because I live, ye shall live also. In that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. How is that possible? Because his life is in us. There is no need, my beloved brothers and sisters, to be trapped, weak. There is power available to us that the combined military powers of this earth do not understand and will never have. And that's a power that cancels death itself. And that power is the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. With that life, we have the power to live the character he developed before he died. The question is, do we want that life? Or are our taste buds so corrupted by secularism and materialism that we really have no desire for the life of Christ? Now, we desire a decent life. Christ didn't die to give you a decent life. You don't need Christ's help to be a decent person. There are a lot of decent atheists running around the place. There are a lot of people who serve Satan and they're decent. You, you can't tell. They don't rob banks, they don't shoot people, they don't rape, they don't steal, steal hubcaps. They don't do that. But they have nothing to do with God. They are polite. They wear suits, they go to work, they are respected, but they have nothing to do with God. I don't need God's help to be polite. I don't need God's help to know, to open the door for a lady. But I need God's help to live above sin. Come on, say something. I need God's help. And a life above sin is the life of Christ. My question to you again, politely, as I put away the holy book. Is this your favorite book? 
Are you fascinated by the possibility of living the life of Christ? Sometimes when I stand here, I wonder to myself, is four minutes to eight. Is it possible there's someone seated there listening to me who feels really no need for Christ? I hope not. But I wonder, is someone listening to me who feels in his or her heart, what's the big thing? <laughs> I'm okay. If you feel that, come and talk to me in that room at the side. Because you are in mortal danger. The Christian lives every day with a deep sense of the need for Jesus Christ. It's like a man who's drowning. He has to come up for air. And when he comes up, he gulps. And you can hear him. <gasps> he sucks it in. And that's how we feel. I need Jesus. I need him. Because I cannot save myself. I cannot walk the upright life. I need the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. To sustain me. How many of you will say with me tonight? Or let me ask you this first. How many of you appreciate the message? Can I see your hand? You mean that? Not because of me, but because it's the God's word. I try to stay as close as I can to the word of God. To stray is to be dangerous. Get into waters you can't man man uh, manage. How many of you will say, Jesus, Father. We're praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. Father. I want that resurrected, powerful life of Jesus to work in me. If you will say that from your heart without trying to impress anyone, could you stand up, please? And I know I make you stand all the time. Some of you have sent me prayer requests. You said, Pray for me, I may be lost. I'm battling a sin, no victory. If those requests you send, I'd like to see you so we can pray together. Please. Because when I pray with you, I am strengthened myself. Do you understand that? Is there someone here who has a particular spiritual battle and need special prayer? Two minutes to eight. A particular spirit, I'm not talking to all of you. A particular spiritual battle and you need special prayer raise your hand I'm not talking to all of you not all of you come right here quickly right here now let's pray <clears throat> God bless you come quickly the rest of us heads bowed eyes closed Come, my dear brother and sister, I'll wait for you coming down the center aisle. My sister to the right, God bless you, come. Every head bowed. Pray with me as I pray for God's people. Anyone else before I pray? Our Father in heaven, I come to you in a quiet moment. After trying my best to deliver the word of God, your word. Your people have come in response to the call that I have made, I believe, at your direction. Father, we have one struggle or another, and we want power. The power is available through faith. And faith is holding on to Jesus Christ and whatever He says, and believing it, and allowing it to live in us. And so in the name of Jesus, Father, I ask you now, because you're not willing that any should perish, that you would lay your power upon each person who moved, requesting special intervention for some spiritual struggle of one kind or another. Lord, in the name of Jesus, help them to understand the power comes by truly with all their heart and soul and mind and might and strength and understanding, embracing Jesus as a real person who loves them and desires to save them and understands them. Lord, let us embrace him tonight by faith in his word. That that power may work in our lives, change our minds, that our greatest joy may be spiritual things, the things that are above. Remember the rest of us, I pray, dear God, have mercy on us. You said in Psalm 103 verse 13, He knoweth our frame. He remembers that we are dust. You know how weak we are, Father. We're not asking you to excuse it. Understand and supply that power and help us. Lift us up and hold us 
Grab us by the arm as you grab, Lord, and pull us out of Sodom. Pull us out of Gomorrah, I pray. And save us. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. And for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen.